All right, welcome to Great Grill Country. This is this. I've been looking. I planned this one about a month ago, and I've really been looking forward to it. So this is this is going to be a all um, folk tale and fairy tale live stream. With we're gonna have stories from lots of different lots of different places. Um, we're going to have some Slavic tales shared by Vlad and Eugene. Uh, Vlad is a uh, Vlad is a uh, software engineer who I met in uh, Florida recently at the Symbolic World Summit, and we had some great conversations. We really hit it off, and actually, to to give credit where credit is due, it's Vlad who actually planted the seed in my mind to do this when we we're having we were having an exchange online about Slavic tales. And then I'm like, hey, Eugene, I talked to Eugene a while back. Eugene is Russian. He is he is a he obviously is interested in in storytelling um, and he has a great sub stack. Um, and so I invited you, Eugene and then uh, Sherry and I both both love stories and fairy tales and talk about them all the time. And then yesterday on a whim <laughs> <laughs> or a move of the spirit. I reached out to Harvest Moon because I had been reading some I had been reading some Quinault uh, folk tales, and Harvest Moon is a Quinault basket weaver and storyteller. She's having some Wi-Fi problems right now. It looks like. Hopefully, we'll have her back. But oh. but 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 I'm hoping that Harvest Moon can share some tales um, from the Pacific Northwest coast from the peoples that are native to that region, which is where I am from. Yeah. And which is where I still live. So um, I'm very much looking forward to that um, because um, there's some there's a deeper level when when a story when story comes from a place that you're connected to, it resonates with you with a, at a at a deeper level because there there are there are these little subtle sense elements in this story that you just that can, that you, that connect you through memory um, mm -hmm. to the place and it just it kind of you can feel the story in your body when that happens and so i found that to be the case a lot of times with the pacific northwest tales even though obviously i'm from a different cultural background geographically i live in that place and so i know some of those sights and smells and sensations and so i can really feel those stories so i'm hoping she'll have she'll sort out her problems and be back with us um i um vlad since you were the inspiration for this stream, <laughs> I will allow you to go ahead and start us off. So um, whatever story you want to share, go ahead. We're, we're, all, we're here to listen and uh, looking forward to it. All right. Uh, well, hi. Well, th thank you. Thank you for being inspired. It wasn't my intention initially. Um, the background, the exchange was we spoke about different different tales and I listed a bunch that in my opinion would be something that most people from Ukraine, Russia, Belarus, so Slavic people would know and including the modern people. Um, and to be honest, this, most of the kids right now and my generation, we didn't read as much as we used to, even though my mom read to me most of the storytelling that we absorbed was through uh, cartoons, which were Soviet cartoons. There was a Soviet multiplication, you know, department of a government called Soyuz Multfilm, which was produced a bunch of amazing cartoon versions of folk tales. And probably the most fundamental, the, the most uh, well-known, the one that every kid would have an understanding of is Kolobok, which is a weird one. So Kolobok is, I, I will not tell the whole story how it happened because um, I'm not a storyteller, I'm an <laughs> engineer, <laughs> but um, the plot itself is quite interesting. Uh, it starts off with the grandma and uh, grandpa who don't have kids. And at some point, um they're they're quite poor and they don't have much but they wanted someone <laughs> so uh the grandpa tells the grandma to 
go into the place where the flour for bread is stored and gather as much as less is left over and bake bake this piece of bread which they named kolobok and it's it's this round round piece of bread and they uh, bake it and they put it on a window um, to kind of cool off and uh, but it, it becomes sentient it's 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 a, a live piece of bread and it rolls over the window and it goes into the woods and it encounters a series of of animals uh first you know the, they're pretty you know uh, small and and not dangerous so a bunny and then um uh, Kolobok sings a song about who he is basically which is already kind of weird because he just came to be um and he sings it to a bunny and bunny lets him off the hook and then uh, there's a wolf and a bear and at some point all of them they kind of want a piece of him but because through his singing and entertainment uh, this childish you know behavior um he gets away the final point of his journey is and is a encountering of the fox and she says hey i'm gonna eat you and he says please don't i'm gonna sing a song to you and he sings the song but the fox which in slavic days usually is 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 a very sly very um wise beast uh, that you don't deal with you need to kind of be clever about how you encounter the fox um she says oh that's a fantastic song i like it so much uh, I, but i i don't hear it very well and then um please come come closer to me and he comes closer and he sings it the second time and she says oh i still don't hear you quite as well but this time it's actually better so come closer and at some point she says oh i i'm just you know deaf uh jump on my nose and sing it from my nose and he jumps on the nose and he starts singing and she eats him basically um and that's the end of the story it's not a happy ending of any sort um and it's 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 a weird thing there are a couple of symbolic aspects and themes that i can point out later um but what if if you what you think of it what what stood out i love the story <laughs> Yeah, oh, maybe I missed voice. something. So Eugene, you can you can. No, no, it's it's perfect, perfect. I want to hear the song. <laughs> it sings. I'll, I'll, I'll send you. I'll send you the link. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Basically, it goes like this: Ya kalabok, kalabok, pambara mition, pa susekam skribion, ya babushki ushol, ya dedushki ushol. It kind of goes like this. Nice. Yeah. Very fun. Yes. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. What What's the translation, Eugene? Okay, it's uh, the retelling of his story. Yeah. It's like his name. He's telling his who he is, like his identity. I am oh. the Kalabok. I am like, like a gingerbread man, right? Kind of right. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was made out of the scraps of, of uh, uh, flour. flour, flour, and uh, um, I was put on the on the windowsill, right, to cool off, and then I ran away from. Babushka from my grandma and grandpa into the woods and then blah 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 so just yeah. retelling of the story <clears throat> and at the end he said doesn't he say at the end that whoever i meet i will actually run away from them yes. it's just you know, he's just too proud basically like oh, it becomes a piece of his identity important. now running away is a piece of his identity uh, that he identity. repeats while he encounters anything new and you can also see the progression of the beasts becoming like more dangerous in, in something that like a bunny cannot really hurt you that much, even though if you're Kalabok, maybe, maybe yes. But then the wolf and the bear, and he says, oh, if I like fox is nothing, but turns out it is. Oh, is that yeah. a translation? Oh, yeah, 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 that's it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if this is if this is if this lands. But when you were telling it, I was thinking how the grandparents had no children. And, you know, I mean, it's 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 kind of like 
glaringly obvious when when a woman is pregnant, we often say she has a bun in the oven. Well, uh, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. In and general, so, sorry, yeah. yeah, but the the oven itself, I want to point out, it's an extremely piece, uh, prominent piece in all of the tales mm-hmm. in in Slavic storytelling. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, the one that the 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 tweet that started it all. I the, there's a story of Zhiharka, which is, um, I don't know, it's a retelling of a retelling. It's it's a thing, but one of the things is when this fox, also a fox, that goes into the um, house and kind of also is sly about and steals this child and gets it to her house and wants to eat it, there, the oven becomes this weapon that is turned against the fox. So uh, this little girl uh, kind of is sly against the fox and uh, puts More her so. into into the oven, yeah. And yeah. the same thing is is the Hansel and Gretel. Um, yeah. That's the same symbological mm-hmm. trope of the you know perpetrator who wants you to put you in the oven becomes the thing that that y- is in the oven. Can... Yeah. Yeah. And also in in uh, there are other parts where ovens are quite important because oven was like a central piece that gives you heat in the you know your house, and that's where a lot of kind of things have it's, it's like a modern version of a tv um and you would be lying on it so ivan uh, and other uh, in slavic tales that are bogatir which is like this knight the warrior that has god given strength and he's you know amazing in all, all sorts of ways um that night one of the main ones is uh, the story of this knight who was for, I don't remember how many years, like 30, 33 years, he was just doing nothing, just laying on that oven. Um, oven is this also sometimes a source of transportation. The Ivan, the, you know, the fool uses that. So ovens in general, somehow it's, it's something you cannot miss in any of the stories if you follow this right, symbol. Right. You know, the my other mom, thing, oh, go oh, ahead. Go ahead. Uh, my mom was just telling a story last night, and actually, I'd never heard her say this before, but she was saying that um, when, she, like, she when she was when she was little, it was before her her dad eventually ended up getting a job in this in in a in the steel mill in Birmingham, but when when she was little, they were still actually like sharecroppers, so they were very poor. So they still didn't have an electric stove, even though she was born in 1952. Like they were, they still had a wood cook stove. And, and so, and this is Alabama. So like in the summer, like her mom would get up at like four o'clock in the morning to prepare the food. So they didn't have to run the wood cook stove in the heat of the day. So. Yeah. The other thing I was thinking about when, when I heard the story Vlad was how the it's not it's not a young couple it's a it's grandparents people who can't have any more children right in the story and and I can't call a book is that his name yeah. okay he he just runs away from the the grandparents well to me that is like running away from your ancestral wisdom yeah. right um so True. Anyway. Also, it's weird because you would think like the title of a grandpa or grandpa requires you to have children, right? Mm. Yeah, uh, but true. Some, sometimes it's also just the age. Like if you're old enough, you you're kind but of. But it's also that. Be... I think it's also that ancestral wisdom always has yeah. children. It always has children, right? It, there's also an element of Pinocchio. You know, when when he wishes on the star to have a child, that isn't really a child yet, but he he wants one so i i think there's some semblance of it yeah and because it's also the start of both stories of someone wishing to have you know descendants basically yeah well vlad you've given us a great story to start with who would like to go next who's inspired well i can share another folk story i mean i didn't plan to share it but since you brought up color book there's another one that's really really deep in my subconscious from you know growing up in russia it's the the one about uh 
the cat, the thrush, and the rooster. Uh, remember that one? Okay, so it's pretty simple. So the cat and the thrush live together, and they have like a, a rooster is like a child there. So, but they every day they go out into the woods to like cut woods. They're like uh, wood choppers or whatever, something like that. And they tell the, the rooster <clears throat> that the fox will come. And you have to just sit with your doors and, and windows closed, never go out. But the most important thing is when the, when the fox start talking, don't respond. So they go away. Of course, the fox comes. And, uh, uh, and uh, the way she, it's always a she in, in Russian, uh, she, because she's like a really sly kind of lady figure. <clears throat> and so she starts uh, like uh, um, telling him some something, like tempting him to respond in some way. And so she, every time, it's, it's, it's I mean, the cycle repeats three times, but every time the uh, fox comes and starts um, uh, kind of try to pull him out, open the window, open, open the door to do something, respond. She gives uh, one piece of uh, something very important for the rooster after another. You know, she'll say, she'll sing a song or, or say something like, oh, uh, uh, like uh, uh, peasants came and threw some uh, peas around and uh, all the birds got it, but the rooster didn't. And, and then every time there's something that she says that kind of gets him, and he, he's, he opens the window and says, how come the, you know, the rooster didn't get it or something like this? And she gets him. And then the thrush and the cat go out into the woods and, and rescue him, basically. So it, it happens three times in a row, but the last time, uh, she actually takes him far, far away into the woods, and they really have to go through like a lot of heroic feats to get him out. But they do get him out. But you know what's imp you know the, it was moving me. I didn't understand anything when I was growing up uh, of what the wisdom of it is. But but recently it's been coming back to me every time I open the news, every time I open <laughs> YouTube, even there's something. That gets my attention. I don't know how YouTube does it, but they do it, you know. And uh, probably ninety percent of the time, I'm caught. <clears throat> and I'm not just caught; I'm taken away into the dark woods. You know, speaking of Dante's dark wood, where, where you ended up, and it's really hard to get out of it. And sometimes I need my friends or somebody uh, to come over. And, and get me out of the of the of those dark places, mm -hmm. and I'm there just because of my own. In uh, I'm there because I wasn't able to not respond when that initial thing came at me. So that's, that's a really good story. Yeah, it's it kind of like a it's it's a kind of it's kind of like a um, a distinction between responding properly and reacting to something yeah. yeah reaction yeah i i want to give a different spin to this this is the same story by the way that Jeharka is that, that the cartoon i uh pointed it's just it also has the cat and the and the bird uh they're blacksmiths and they go out to sell their things and there's also fox but instead of the rooster which is in 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 Russian, which means he has like a golden, you know, that thing on top of um, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Calm. And this is a theme that's extremely prominent in Slavic folk tales in general is not trusting strangers is like there's mm -hmm. one about goats and mother goat ha that has seven little goats and many more about your children are protected in this house but you necessarily have to leave for some reason and you need to give them some advice on how to stay safe and you give it to them but they are being tricked and it's basically about you know the the, the wisdom of it is 
be careful because there are someone out there who wants to get in and who wants to steal you, eat you, harm you in, in some way. So the, the moral uh, oftentimes is uh, don't trust the strangers, right? They can trick you in the story of seven goats. The, the wolf, he um, changes his voice to resemble the voice of the mother, which is quite interesting because now with AI and things, that's literally can happen. And <laughs> all of these uh, stories, they kind of are very deeply embedded, I think, in our, in our subconscious about how we should act in certain way of not trusting the stranger or... Um, another motive is is greed is like when you ask for more and more things at the end you will get nothing which is you know it's it, it, some of these things they they kind of are they migrate from story to story and there are many of these examples i want to hear a story from harvest moon now <laughs> <laughs> it, it's so interesting to hear um about that that story and uh in my tribe the quinault tribe we have a uh well uh the the quinault is word name is siakko and it means shy ones or shy people and i think when I first heard the, the meaning of it, I thought, how interesting, a, a storyteller that's shy. <laughs> um, and yet again, the shyness of the story and the, the, the whole core of the story is, is the teaching of what he spoke of earlier, of the, of the wearies of, of approaching a, a, a I can't think of the word, the secret, Stranger. you know, stranger. stranger. Yeah. 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 Would you yeah. guys like to hear the cute? It's only about five minutes. I want to hear yeah, it. Yeah, I would love yeah. to hear a story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> oh, cool. I thought I was just going to, I thought I was just going to be here watching you guys. Okay. Okay. No, no. no. <laughs> Long ago, the Quinault village had many long houses, and every family had a salish woolly dogs named Old Turk. Every spring and summer, lots of salmon was harvested, smoked, and cured for the time of darkness or winter. The salmon hung in the rock of the long house man too busy catching and curing salmon old took had to wait for scraps from their mm -hmm. human families so old took went to the shy people and told them about the salmon mm -hmm. The shy people did not believe the old Tuk. Old Tuk told the shy people, you are, are tall and strong. If you come to Longhouse tonight when, when, when man is sleeping, you can look into the rafters and see for yourself. When you do see the salmon, drop some down for us. For, for we are hungry and man too busy to feed us. Shy was worried man would, would, would see them. Oh, Tuk told the shy people, man, he, he, he worked too hard. He will not wait unless we bark. If you share salmon with us, we will not bark. <laughs> Thinking it through, the shy people agreed to share with Oto and both can feast on salmon. That night, 
when man was sleeping, all took her the shy people sneaking into the village. They very quietly lifted the roof up and looked into the rafters. The shy people and all the Otuk had a great feast. When man woke up, oh, he was furious. All his salmon wiped out. Oh, man looked at Otuk, big, full belly, but, but knew he couldn't reach the rafters that night. There was more salmon in the rafters. And once again, there was another great feast. <laughs> the shy people and all the Otuk agreed. This was the best thing ever happened to them. That night when man was sleeping, there was another great feast. The shy people, there was just enough salmon just for the shy people. Oh, took so mad, started barking loud to wake man. Man chased the shy people all the way to the hillside with fire. Shy people mad at all the Otuk because they barked. Time of darkness upon them. Salmon very scarce. Men even tied roof down and kept fires burning all night long. Oh, 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 oh. he managed to catch some dog salmon, cured them and hung them in the rafters. Oh, took smell the dog salmon and their mouths drooling with anticipation of another great feast. Belly for brains. Oh, took went to the shy people and told them about the, the sa dog salmon that man had in his rafters. The shy people spoke. We were thinking of eating dog. Ota quickly replied, you mean dog salmon, dog salmon. The shy people grabbed all the Otuk and quickly ate them. And this is why the Salish woolly dogs are extinct. Do not mess with the sea, ot, ko, the shy people, or you know them as Bigfoot. Oh, wonderful! Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> it, it's it's really good to have an actual storyteller on the storytelling <laughs> podcast. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> that um, was amazing. Thank you. Thank you so the way you told it kind of felt like a dance to me. Yeah, it was yeah. the voice, the mimic, the emotion itself. It was very. You know, like it wasn't just the story itself; it was also the way you told it. Oh, so, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm Har oh, yeah. I was just Harvest Moon. Do you mind telling us a little bit about how 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 did you um, how did you learn to to tell stories? How did how did you learn the stories, and how did you learn your technique? Well, as a young child from toddler, or from the time I started talking, I was a really good liar. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I, I, I got in a lot of trouble. And so um, my middle name now is Harvest Loophole Moon because I, I discovered um, when I was about 11 or 12 um, storytelling. And I go, hey, 
Hey, I can do story. T- I can lie and not get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one part of it. And the second part is uh, my great great grandfather was a storyteller from the Chinook tribe who spoke with Boaz. And in fact, Boaz was one of his best friends. And he helped create the, the Chinook Wawa. And um, I even actually recently just learned word for word one of my great great grandfather's legends. And oh boy. Mm-hmm. So, in a way, I was destined to be who I am. Mm-hmm. So, that's my answer, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wonderful. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. I noticed that it's your story it's way more complex the details and the plot itself than the ones that we told so what is the target audience what's the age gap that that this would be uh i imagine for little kids um it's more about like looking at you and and seeing your emotion um but not as much of the meaning of of what happens in russian folk tales there's the sense of repetition and you know how kids love to rewatch. So they kind of know what to expect the next time. And, and many times we have repetition here. You also had repetition of people going like in and out and, you know, the, the salmon being replenished. But to me, it seemed more complex in, in as a story, what would be the the age of of kids that that would you know get it basically it's a it's a it's a really uh inherited art form Mm -hmm. and i've been i've spent you guys say you're a good storyteller well it took me four decades to learn how to tell a story right so i think it's the it's the ability of of constantly honing your your uh, your presentation, because um, I recently been uh, honored by a famous storyteller, Johnny Moses, who was only twelve years old when he was telling stories all over the world, and so uh, he gifted me the the. He said, "You're the only storyteller that can tell stories from newborn to elder." Mm-hmm. And so I think it's the way I present it, because when I look at the audience, I don't look I don't look at them like they're naked or or look over their head. I look right at them and decipher who who's here with me, who wants to hear this story. And so Johnny Moses mentioned you can tell stories for all ages because I see parents bringing in their kids flopping them down in front of me, going back and pulling out their phone, you know, and and yeah. then after a while when I when I speak, the men want women with big hearts. <laughs> you know, and, and then all of a sudden the phones start going down. <laughs> and, the parents, and they start coming forward. So the, the children don't get it. But the adults get it, so it's the it's a magical line that you that I that I like a um, like a um, balancing person as I'm walk tramping. You know, I'm I'm doing a this very hard brain um, mixing as I'm telling the story, yeah. and also when you make a mistake. One time I said lawyer instead of warrior. And boy, did that make a big impression. Yeah, you're the strongest lawyer. <laughs> so, so a like single that. story can change based on the audience. It could be the same story, but exactly. based on... So do you then hide certain details and add certain details? Or in to kids, I imagine some of the more complex, you know, story points and details could be you know, hidden and you can win them over by the mimics and by, you know, intonation of the voice. What was the practicality of it? Or is it because you've been doing it so long, it's just natural? 
um, like I, I think it is, it's the, it's, I'm a Scorpio, so I, I like to have everything perfect when I tell a story. So when I, when I initially come up and start telling legends, I uh, really decipher and, and try to, to make that person who's sitting over there meant this, this legend is just for them. And, um, th but this mm -hmm. little two-year-old who can't seem to sit down and be quiet, you know, there's a part of the legend where they go, they, the parents came and, and told them to sit down and shut up. And that little kid just sat down and shut up right away. <laughs> you know, <It's> amazing. <laughs> it was in the legend, but you know, it, it, you know, and then it just, you know, filtered all the whole, the whole mm. audience down. So, mm. wow. I, did I answer the question? You did. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Like, to me, it okay. seemed like okay. this same approach with stand up that that now people do when they kind of this material. It's like waves that that you hit different audiences with, and then you kind of know what sticks in certain crowds and certain geographies and certain age groups and races and things. So it's, it's extremely interesting. It's, it's definitely. Yeah. It's like a, like a, um, well, like Martin Shaw says, you have to like in, in storytelling, you have to leave room for the spirit. Well, you know, I, I've been um, re-listening to a book by, he's actually also a really great storyteller. He's an Irishman named John O'Donohue. But he was talking yesterday in the book, he was talking about voices and the voices that we have and the many voices that we have inside of us, right? And, but he connects that to resonance. And when I was listening to Harvest talking about, you know, directing her voice to certain people in the audience, it's not just the words that that are actually uh, working their magic. It's the resonance between uh, the voice, the, you know, the, that special voice, like I got the impression from Harvest that when, when she's telling the story of the bear and then she says, and the bear said, sit down and shut up. <laughs> There's another voice there, yeah. a voice that resonates with that two-year-old, right? because the two-year-old has heard that voice <laughs> right? before and, and it gets, and it gets incorporated into the story. And I think that's, what's beautiful about stories because in stories you have dialogue. And so you do have different voices in your story, right? You have the voice of the Fox and you have the voice of the bear and the voice of what's his name? Colabook. Colabook. Oh, and the okay. voice of the grandparents and the voice right. of, right? Or you have the voice of the, um, is it Otuk Harvest? Oh, yeah. Otuk and Otuk. Otuk was, a, Otuk yeah. was a, a old Salish woolly dogs. I think I goofed up the legend at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in that story, you have all these different voices too, right? But all those voices are coming out of one person, and 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 um, I don't know. I just that just struck me, especially because I had it, you know, on the top of my head from listening to John O'Donohue yesterday. And I think that's really interesting. And I mean, I'm I'm personally really fascinated with the idea of resonance. Um, um, there's a there's a guy named Matthias Desmet who wrote a book that I read and um, he talks about our bodies as stringed instruments, like our tendons and our ligaments are stretched over bone. Right. And, um, and we literally as infants in the womb begin to resonate with our, with the, the sounds outside, especially the mother's voice, the mother's, body language like literal body language heartbeat all that stuff and then when the child is born they they're they're um there's this phase where the infant doesn't know where its body ends and the mother's body begins and it resonates completely he said he, he puts it so beautifully he says the 
the clanging of the well and the woe of the mother. And it's not just her voice, right? It's, it's her being, her very being impacts, resonates, like vibrates into the, into the, into the body of the child. And, and it can, and this is psycho, this is psychology. He's a psychologist. And he said, and it can, it can determine um, what will resonate and what will, you know, what kind of trauma or, I don't even know how to explain it at the moment, but you know, that child will experience growing up. Like it, it almost gives them their direction. And so like when Harvest says it was her destiny to be a storyteller, I think of all the vibration, right? That moved from one generation to the next, right down to Harvest, right? Where she has no choice in a sense but to tell yeah. stories. Well, finding the right harmony is kind of like what the process of finding your identity is, right? Which is kind of like reminds me of the Kolobok story that Vlad began with. And then um, yeah. Eugene, um, actually a couple days ago um, in his uh, Substack, he was, he, he had a piece that about the, about identity. He was telling the story of like, uh, of a rabbi, um, who uh do you want to do you want to tell that story oh actually? yeah yeah since it's I yours did. yeah go ahead yeah it's fine <laughs> i mean i read it somewhere <laughs> i mean <laughs> there was this uh hasid uh, rabbi in the name of zusia and uh shortly before his death uh he he started weeping uncontrollably and his disciples uh would come up to him and say why are you weeping zusia and he said, uh, I mean, w what's the reason? Because you are almost as, as um, wise and um, uh, godly as Moses. And you're, pro you're as, almost as uh, hospitable as Abraham. Of course, when you go to heaven, you're going to be judged very favorably. What's, what's the point? I mean, you've lived such a life. And he answered, <clears throat> this is not what worries me. What worries me is that when I go to heaven, God will not ask me about why I didn't live like, why I wasn't more like Moses and why I wasn't more like Abraham. He's gonna, I'm afraid he's gonna ask me, why wasn't I more like Zeusia, mm. like myself? And the person who told the story, I heard it from, from actually from a Ukrainian uh, philosopher, Alexander Filonenko, uh, from, I think he's from Kharkov actually. And, uh, and he uh, basically says that it, the, the biggest tragedy in this world is to live somebody else's life, not your own. And uh, it really struck me because basically it's all about, um, like, I wake up today and uh, am I myself today or even now, this moment? Or am I trying to be somebody, somebody else? Somebody I think, am I putting on the fig leaves? to cover up something lacking in me, some, some sort of shame, pr you know, primal shame, or am I actually dropping those leaves and I'm willing to risk being who I am? Because ultimately that's the question that, you know, God will ask me and maybe, I mean, he won't ask me, but I'll just see it in, in his eyes. I mean, I made you you know, a treasure, have you lived, have you been yourself sort of thing? And it resonated with me as, as well, because when I look at my children, I have three, three children. I mean, in, in the final analysis, when I look at them, I want them to be who they are. Mm, <laughs> I just yeah. don't want them to be anything else. And, and yeah. you know, it's funny that you say that because there's a story in Revelation Right, like if you want, if you want to put it in that context, mm -hmm. there's a story of when when we when we meet God, He puts a name on our forehead. Yeah, and it's and it's it's our ident it's who we are, and and I always got the, I always got the impression that when that happens, we have, and I heard John O'Donohue phrase it like this mystery the mystery of recognition i thought man that is so true because when we recognize something it is somehow a mystery to us because we don't know why 
something fe- something foreign, let's say, something we've never seen before or thought before feels familiar, right? And and I've always had the impression that when that name is given, we're we're like, of course. Yes, 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 yes. yes. You know? Well, in, in in general <laughs> names. I want to, again, want to bring in a little bit of, of my context as an engineer. Naming things in, in code and everything is among the most difficult parts because you, you, you're meant to name it the way that it represents, the way that it functions. In case of my son, his, we came up with a name even before conception, right? So in a way, he existed before the body, before the... Implement. He was more abstract, but then he kind of became real. And the same way with with voices and with kids, you have certain you know inheritance. You have certain biological, genetical, cultural. And what Eugene was talking, I, what to me felt like was, how do we make sure that it's not completely uh, like unattached to everything, you know? unattached to biology, something we see now, or unattached to mm-hmm. culture, that it's still grounded, but it has this sort of unique take, unique voice, something that in their retelling uh, is is brought uniquely by them, right? Mm-hmm. And where that uniqueness comes from is, is, is a mystery, really. Like, well, how is... Because everything you speak, the language you've got, all of the sounds, all of the stories, everything is, is a remix, right? It's very hard to come up with anything unique. It's most likely you've got, you destructed one concept, destructed the other concept and put the pieces together in a way that it fits and then it call it yours, right? Even genetics work that way, right? Piece of mother, yeah. piece of father. Um, so deconstruction and reconstruction, that's mm-hmm. when a uniqueness uh, is is born in a way, in my opinion. Well, I mean, I would say there's a way that the reason that stories are important is that ultimately what this, what all stories are trying to do is they're trying to, to guide you in the process of becoming a human being. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And which is why we ignore them at our peril. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, when when, uh, when you guys were asking Harvest about her audience and, you know, like, will this story work for a two-year-old or a, an adult or an elder? Um, I was thinking about Origins' three ways of interpreting scripture. Um, and... He talks about it in terms of, um, hang on, I just, <laughs> my memory is like crap. So it's, it's um, literal, which is like a, a superficial interpretation of the story, which is probably mostly what children understand, right? And then there's, and he, and he connects those those two, uh, the parts of our body. So our flesh, right, is the literal. The soul is the moral message. And the spirit is the, is the um, eternal incorporeal reality that the passage conveys. And, um, and I love how he maps that on to body, soul, and spirit, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and not only that, but it also hits all the levels of 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 our you know actual being right being a child being a a teenager who might need a moral lesson you know to being a sage where you immediately grasp the deeper reality in the story you know and so i think that if you tell tell a good story especially an old story which is the beauty of first nation stories and you know, Slavic fairy tales, like, I don't know if I was to tell a story of what happened to me yesterday, how that's going to land, because it doesn't have, it's not aged, right? Like a good, 
like a good whiskey or a good, a good bottle of wine. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, it hasn't it hasn't shed all that all those um, superfluous elements, right? And and been like put into this time capsule that is going to hit all those levels. So anyway, what I'm saying is, I don't think, or I do think that someone like Harvest, when she tells an old story, that's going to always land mm -hmm. with every age group. Yeah, it's like And it probably does, right, Harvest? Yeah, yeah. Yes. I one of the things I love doing is I we I, I love going to the movies with friends and instantly the, the moment we walk out of the movie theater I ask them tell me the story and you will not retell a three hour long story right there's instantly going this filtration you know memory process that only certain key elements will be preserved. And when that was going on for you know hundreds of years or thousands of years in some case, that's what I think what you're describing. And that process ensures that it hits, you know, it hits the whatever, just a, a human, right? The human consciousness, human mind, because that's what kind of was was passed through the the. But I the, but the I think what's What's most fascinating about that, Vlad, is that it's not a conscious process. Mm -hmm. It's a subconscious process, right? And so, the symbols, the symbols that are used in the, in the old stories are always true. It's like dreams, right? Like Martin Shaw says, how does he put that, Nate? Um, I think we need to know, I think we need to realize that we're in a dream, Right. And he says that because we're in a symbolic world. Right. And, and so like, I'm just thinking about my own dreams, for example, I told a dream once in, in a, in one of these um, live streams that I did and, and um, Neil, I think it was Neil's Neil pulled out a, a, you know, Carl Jung's biography and he's like, he reads me back my dream. Does that mean that I'm not original? No, that means I'm a human being because we use basically the same language, the symbolic language to dream with, right? And so that, that, like, that is our language. Well, and then we, we transliterate that in our conscious selves to words, right? But the words always fail. Like if we want to be propositional about something, those fail, but the story never fails because the story is built out of images, right? It's built from these images. And as George MacDonald says, <laughs> those images are imbued with meaning. And the meaning is, you know, is always there. It's like, it's always the same, right? That's why when we dream of a tree or we dream of a bear or we dream of water, or we dream of a house. Those the you can you know doesn't matter who the person is. That symbolism is probably the same universally for most people. It just the context would change, right, for your your life. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So we actually have a request from the audience. Um, if if either um, Vlad or Eugene uh, would like to. They, there was a request for the story of Vodnik. Vodinoy? Probably Vodinoy, yeah. This is the... Mm -hmm. the, water Vodnik, goblin. the water goblin. If it's Vodinoy, I, I know some. Yeah, I don't know much about Vodinoy, except for one cartoon story that Vlad gotcha. probably knows about. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So, so in, in general, I don't know the exact story, but he's a, he's an element. He's like a monster in the sea, right? He is, um, Vodanoi is, is kind of like a spirit of the waters of the swamps. We also have the Slavic folk folktext before Christianity. It was, um, we believed in, in fairies and of sorts. Uh, there were, uh, forest, 
uh, spirits. Um, there were mermaids, and sometimes mermaids and uh, Vajanoi would like because they inhabit the same, you know, land, same, same waters. They are commonly, you know, like the dual of sorts. Um, because mermaids are a female version and this goblin thing, he's kind of ugly and scary. And um, he, even if you look at the pictures, he doesn't really have a shape of sorts. It's very you know, blobby. Um, so the story itself, I'm not sure which one is, is referenced. He's not as prominent in, at least in the modern cultures, something that I wrote, told in the beginning, at least my generation and, and now my son, uh, we don't have like a book of Slavic tales, even though Nicholas has, has recently uh, started a crowd, uh, crowdfunding. We experience it through screens, through now YouTube. One of the benefits of Soviet Union collapse is now all of those uh, Soviet cartoons are free to use. You can watch them unlimitedly for as much as you want and um that's the way we at least me and my family has grounded ourselves is through those cartoons um which i think is a little bit different than than you know being completely verbal something that struck me in the way that harvest um told the story is it was way more embodied right than mm -hmm. just being purely linguistic um, and something that you, Sherry, said is about our bodies being like string instruments. Mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine, she's a, she's a director and she does theater, you know, and I spoke to her, which is funny, and she said, out of all theater forms, her most favorite is the clowns. It's the clown at the pantomime, which to <laughs> me was extremely weird. Like, I did not expect that answer. Yeah. And she explained that this is extremely difficult to do because you are you 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 you're limited. You don't you cannot use your voice, but you still need to tell a story, mm -hmm. a story that will make laugh adults, will make make laugh kids. So it's even more, you know, challenging, and it's a dying art form to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, but I think limiting certain things like the voice or cutting out the voice or cutting out pantomime or, or any type of you know way to embody or enrich the story sometimes can be a benefit but our modern culture i think we just kept the voice part and um, the movies now brought in more visuals and maybe that's a detriment at least in my experiences yeah. because now everything is you know imagined for you yeah you don't have the same you know skill to to imagine it for yourself right i think it's definitely a detriment actually i'll, I'll tell a little story um Yay. Or just an well, not a story, just an anecdote, just an anecdote, <laughs> not a story, not a story, not, not a real story. It's just an <laughs> anecdote of something that happened recently. So I was in a I was in a meeting for work, and my my boss's daughter came came was came on camera and was and, and was and she was telling her to go and read. And her daughter was saying, "But I can't picture it," because he was telling her like. Like that, that uh, um, you have to use your imagination as a screen when you're reading a book. And because she was wanting to watch something on a screen instead. Mm -hmm. And she was like, no, no, go and read. You just, you, you just, you just, the screen is in your head. You imagine it. And she's like, I can't imagine it. Yeah. And she's just like, like, uh, and she's like, and it's like seven, eight. Like, so this is why I, I think I saw Chad in the chat earlier. Chad said something about the way in which a while back that really resonated with me about how consumerism has outsourced our imagination. Mm -hmm. And that's precisely a real example of that happening, where it's like a child who should be full of imagination. Imagination should be the easiest thing in the world for a child. Feels that she can't imagine because she's been fed these images to consume. Yeah. So, yeah. Also, Nate, you you mentioned you wanted to tell a story that's 
Oh was... yeah. Well, I don't really. I'm so I've come from a singing family, more of than a, more of a storytelling. Family, but I'll do. I'll share. I'll share a song. I'll, I'll I'll sing a song that my my granny used to hum when she was doing dishes all the time. So yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. Okay. Here we go. I, you're finally getting me to sing on camera. Uh oh. Yay. Here we go. All right. Here we go. Twas early in the month of May when green buds were a swelling. Sweet William on his deathbed lay for love of Barbary Allen. He sent his servants to the town. To the place where she was dwelling, saying, You must come to my master, dear, if your name be Barbara Ellen. Slowly, slowly she got up, and slowly she drew nigh him, but the only words to him did say, Young man, I think you're dying. He turned his face unto the wall, for death was in him welling. Goodbye, goodbye to my friends all. Be kind to Barbara Allen. When he was dead and laid in his grave, she heard the death bells knelling, and every stroke to her did say, Hard hearted Barbara Allen. Oh, mother, mother, dig my grave, make it long and narrow. Sweet William died on yesterday, and I shall die tomorrow. Oh, Father, Father, dig my grave. Make it long and narrow. Sweet William died of love for me, and I shall die of sorrow. She was buried in the old churchyard. Sweet William was buried beside her. Out of William's heart grew a red, red rose. Out of Barbary Allen's a green briar. They grew and grew in the old churchyard. Till they could grow no higher. And in the end... Formed a true lover's knot, the rose grew round the briar. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> wow. I think of my granny, so I can't get through it without singing <laughs> or without crying. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well. Well, kudos to you for getting through it. <laughs> Um, I, um, I just wanted to read one one thing. Um, it's a quote from a story that George MacDonald wrote called Uncle Cornelius. And he's before he tells the story, he's in a dialogue with these uh, with his uh, three nieces and an, or two nieces and a nephew. And the children say this to him: "Think then, you think, Uncle, that all these stories are only legends." which if you could follow them up would lead you back to some one of the awful monsters that have since quite disappeared from the earth. And then he says, it is possible those stories may be such legends, but that was not what I intended to lead you to. I gave you that, I gave you that only as something like what I am going to say now. What if, mind I only suggest it, what if the direful creatures whose report lingers in these tales should have an origin far older still? What if 
They were the remnants of a vanishing period of the Earth's history, long antecedent to the birth of Mastodon and Iguanodon, a stage namely when the world as we call it had not yet become visible, was not yet so far finished as to part from the invisible world that was its mother, and which on its part had not then become quite invisible, was only almost such. And when, as a credible consequence, strange shapes of the, those now invisible regions, gorgons and chimeras dire, might be expected to gloom out occasionally from the awful fauna of an ever-generating world upon that one which was being born of it. Hence, the life periods of a world being long and slow, some of these huge unformed bulks of half-created matter might somehow, like the megatherium of later times, roll at age-long intervals, clothed in a mighty terror of shapelessness into the half-recognition of human beings, whose consternation at the uncertain vision were barrier enough to prevent all further knowledge of its substance. I think that that is the perfect, like, description of that deeper meaning that is contained within creation itself, within the forms in our creation, right? And and I love how he he phrases it, you know, how they gloom out, <laughs> and 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 um, and because we don't we're not certain about it. We don't have any certainty, right? And we live in an age of certainty. If it's not, if we're not certain, then it isn't true, right? And he says here, you know, at the consternation of the uncertain vision, that's the barrier to prevent all further knowledge of its substance. And, and like, for me, this is the beauty of storytelling, because you take those images where those gorgons and chimeras can gloom out, right? And 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 you just, you know, like Harvest did so beautifully, you just lay them out like laying a table. And mm -hmm. and you let everything, you know, to to each person gloom out of that story. And and they will. They will gloom out to you in the way that you need them to, you know. Well the images are so powerful too like i mean look at the song that i that i just sang right mm -hmm. so like the image like the image the image at the end of barbara allen that like this image of like you know plants growing out of the graves yeah. and then growing up you know and, and growing up the church and intertwining it's just like it's such a powerful image of yeah. like death and rebirth um so mm -hmm. stories have powerful images can i ask a question to harvest Real quick. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, when you tell this story about the shy people in, in your language, does it sound, does it co come across different? Uh, the, the, I just came across uh, Larry Ralston, an elder from the Connaught tribe. He shared the legend to me about four years ago. And uh, I actually memorized it the way I, he sent it because it sounded like the 70s you know hey man drop some down for us we are hungry man <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so i go hey this is a really 70s you know the way he the way he heard it and wrote it down it was in the 70s you know and so i think it gives a my stories are more in in literally timelines you know the, the the legend of the spirit of rolling rocks is a is a contemporary where you know you always have one in the office and i'm always amazed when you know the no ears she's a real scoundrel but there's always one in the office you know who i mean and all the people i was i'm amazed at how many people go yeah we know that one in the office <laughs> so in my perspective, it's more of a um, morals and history, and best of all, entertainment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, it doesn't necessarily have to go with uh, 
with the language or it's more with the the presentation yeah well the reason i ask is because interesting i i mean when i read george MacDonald in russian it didn't strike me that much yeah when i, I can read imagine. it in english in his english whatever mm -hmm. it was uh, I mean, especially his poems in the Fan Fantastis. Uh, yeah. They were like moving, 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 moving. And I wonder if if you told this story in your language, well, I don't know what language it is of your tribe. I wonder if it would probably, because language grounds you, uh, I don't know how, but it, there's something very um, interesting in the sound of the language itself. What is the name for the shy people again? In, in uh, see art co see art co yeah see art co shy people or shy ones but that story also pertains to shy people and the shy ones you know they work together as a unit you know they they uh they they, they were just one of us also you know right. so one common thing i noticed is by the way, it's common in in some some of the stories. So the element of the song, right? You sang, um, the way you told the story, I'm pretty sure it can be sung as well uh, with certain amount of creativity. Also the, the song of Golovok, uh, song, song in general is a very, you know, important piece of, of of stories, especially for kids and and memorization and the sounds, right? Sometimes even the fact that it rhymes can affect for this element or this particular animal or whatever it is to be in the story. Same thing with which I noticed the common between you know all the Slavic tales and especially Ukrainian tales, um, and the story of, of harvest is is the animals, right? The animals have been um, so so in Ukrainian storytelling more than in, in Russian. There's this anthrop anthropomorphic element to it, which it, it pr proceeds everywhere. But if you kind of group the stories and and in, in Russian, you know, Pushkin's stories, they have way more people in them, like mm -hmm. actual people. Whereas in Ukrainian tales, it's more, you know, more more animals that have been imbued with certain human qualities and, and consciousness and ability to speak. And sometimes it's even bred. So that's um, also what I found similar. Anything else that you, you think is kind of universal are, so, so the idea of an inside and an outside that you shouldn't trust seems to be a common, you know, element regardless of culture, language, or even time period. Um, anything else that that is prominent in your particular? So one of the examples I gave in in Russian is like wishing more, more, more until you don't have anything, um, or or a fool or a name. My, my wife gave an interesting example of naming. We may want to come back to that, but anything you particularly knowing your stories, are there any common, you know, tropes like greed or like anything else that that, you, that come to mind for you? Are you talking to Harvest? To any, to all of you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I I would say this like this is what I this is what I thought of when you were talking. It's like there's like a, there's this universal element that runs through like almost all storytelling and almost all myth where there is a there's there is a connection between the animal and the human that is just not mm -hmm. you can't deny this is it's even in the bible with the images of the of the animal figure headed figures that are that are around the throne of god and then you finally get to the one that's like the one that has the face of a man and it's like the idea is somehow like the human the human being contains all of the animals as yeah. well as being human um, i was i was i was thinking about how because i have like i live i live in the woods too and um i have a lot of animals and that 
you know, that's basically who I have conversation with most of the day <laughs> for times like this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, the thing that comes to my mind is, first of all, I hate the word anthropomorphizing mm -hmm. because we think that in order for an animal to speak, it has to be a human being. And that's not true. Okay. Mm -hmm. Animals speak. And if you live with them closely enough, you will learn to hear what they're saying. You know, like when I was listening to Harvest's story of the dog who wants the, you know, the shy people to come and bring the salmon down. Um, I can, I, I got my dog's face in my head going, asking me for something. That they do that, right? Like they'll come and say, and if you're paying enough attention and this is the thing that we lack modern people we lack attention this is what people who who uh like the like like harvests people um farmers ranchers anyone who lives close to the land they they cultivate attention because it their survival depends on attention and so when the dog suddenly shows up and gives them that glaring Mm, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, that deer is hanging up there in the trees. And then you look at the dog and say, no. Right. And, th and that's a conversation. You just yeah. had a conversation with your dog. OK. And that dog didn't become human in order for you to have that conversation. That dog was a dog always and will always be a dog. You're bringing you know, it in. Sherry, what's happening is you're bringing it into participation with the human through if you your don't, having a conversation with it. This is what I always say. If you don't listen to your animals, they won't talk to you. Just like if I, I never listened to you, Nate, you would never talk to me. Okay? <laughs> it's just that simple. Yeah. You know, they're like, she never listens. Why should I say anything? Right? <laughs> and, and, and so it's like... Um, this is something that that just irks me because, um, you know, I love animals. And like I said, I talk to them all the time. OK, always. And I've had wild animals. I've rescued many wild animals. And and is, you know. They're afraid. Often they're injured. They're afraid when I first encounter them. I have to just ignore their fear and and get them so that I can help them. But as soon as I begin to help them, they, they soften and I see it, they soften and they stop being a wild animal and they come into relationship with me. And the, the most incredible thing about it is that it feels like I've entered into the consciousness of something else. And I've had this with training horses, you know, especially with training horses. But, um, you know, I, I, I stopped on a highway one time and picked up a red-tailed hawk that was hit by a truck. And there was like eight people standing around this hawk. And they were just, and it was just like, you know, terrified, right? And I just walked, I said to my husband, stop the truck, stop the truck. And I got out and I took my coat off and I walked straight through the people and I threw my coat over the bird and I picked it up and they were all like, well, that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> and then I grabbed the bird and I brought him into the truck. My husband's like, what now? And I said, oh, well, we'll figure it out, you know. And I got a cardboard box and we were, we were on a trip. Like we were traveling, right? And I got a cardboard box and I make, poked a couple holes in it and I put a stick through there. And I uncovered the bird and I sat him on the stick and I grabbed some hamburger out of the cooler and I just started feeding him and we drove the 500 Ks to the next town. And by the time we got there, he was completely calm and he was eating out of my hand. Yeah. And, and it's not, not because he has no choice. An animal will not eat if they're afraid, okay? They won't eat, they won't take, if they don't trust you, they won't take anything from you. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, there's a there's a there's an in between space between human beings and animals, and the reason fairy tales talk about talking animals is because talk animals talk. Okay, 
They do. Well, it's an amazing story. Yeah. Domestication, the domestication of a wild animal. I think it's one of the most also universal stories in general. Uh, in general, you know, how to train your dragon, all of the, you know, even even Beauty and the Beast in a way is is that is is that animalistic dangerous part. If you are open to a relationship with it, it it kind of you can use something extremely you can you can get something out of it useful and maybe build a real relationship i think what you have you seen any of you seen there's a short cartoon called the boy the mole the fox and the horse the boy the mole the fox and the horse it's a short cartoon it's extremely beautifully made it's a modern one i think you would enjoy it greatly and there is a moment i believe there where and in several stories, even in Shrek, there's this confusion where suddenly an animal speaks and everyone's like, you can speak? I'm like, yeah, but no one no one listened before. And, and so I, I didn't th think it was, you know, useful even. So that's that's exactly the thing that you, you know, highlighted there. It's interesting, the whole idea about listening, I really like it. And what uh, Sherry said about uh, before, you, you were talking about the resonance. Uh, uh, it's also one of the tropes, I think. And I and recently I've been finding a lot of it in the Silmarillion. Because, um, yeah, basically the, the world appeared when uh, God, the Luvatar, sang it into existence. Right. But he did it through those Valar or the angels, sort of say, you know, the, the powers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he says that basically, at first, those angels, those Valar, uh, didn't un comprehend the minds of each other. And uh, they were, uh, for a long time, they were like sitting and listening to each other's themes to start comprehending the minds of each other before they could together sing the melody that God sang originally, or basically they were part of, participate with each other. And that's like a very interesting picture in my mind because I play uh, in, a, in a in a balalaika orchestra here. Oh, music. wow. <laughs> anyway. I'd love to see that. Yes, yes, yes. But one thing uh, that strikes me is that whenever we, there's like 15 people playing together and I play the guitar and uh, you can't really have the music proper until you hear what the other person is playing, especially the one close to you. Uh, unless you hear them really hear, I mean, it's like not just with your ears, but with your whole being hear what they're saying, then it's going to resonate and it will bring up the right response and the right, and you have to play that response. Otherwise, there will be no music. So basically, those Ainur, the, the, the Valar, you know, the, the, the powers in Tolkien's world, they sit and listen. But one of them, Melkor, the kind of a e evil mm -hmm. protagonist, raises his voice above the voice of his brethren in the music and basically creates a cacophony. Discord. And discord of Melkor, a chaos ensues. And the kind of, the discord of Melkor is basically the universal theme of evil that it's flows into the world. Yeah, and, uh, and, and, you know, the whole story and the whole Silmarillion and the Lord of the Rings is basically dealing with a overflow of that cacophony. But, uh, but it's interesting that I hear that cacophony. And even now in this call, I mean, I, we, uh, Sometimes I want to say something, but then I really sometimes have to kind of hold myself back and say, have you heard what's being said before you can, before you open your yeah. mouth? Mm -hmm. Because you can create cacophony like this. Yeah. But if we are to create music, then you really have to, I really have to wait for the resonance. And then, and then it will, it will sound. So. Um also the space I, I i will take the responsibility the risk of, of creating the cacophony but sometimes you also need to wait for 
for the space to be vacated for you to speak or for you to enter. My my grandfather was a conductor in in, in orchestra, so sometimes when there's too many voices in my um, uh, uh, kuma, I'm not even sure how it translates in, into oh. English, right? So uh, a godmother to my son, she plays an orchestra on a cello. And when you have so many different instruments, you need a conductor, you need like an MC or someone who, like a, a Nate as a host, who would make it obvious for someone to speak, for someone to give certain, you know, their melody, their input, their... Um, and I think that's another role of a storyteller is something that Harvest says that you, you engage the audience. So it's not just a one way, you know, thing. A story fills the room and depending on who's in the room, it it kind of plays plays out as well. Right. If you if you can speak, if you can direct attention, if you can silence a child in a way that makes sense in the story, right? Um so I think that the music, even from physical standpoint, you know, like a vibrations of air, um, it's it's filling, and the stories are also filling the physical space and the consciousnesses of of everyone involved, and and it's very difficult to navigate that to to make it stick, right? Not not be filtered out to direct attention in an age where attention is lacking, as Sherry pointed out, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very, very complex problem. Um, I think, I just, uh, oh, go oh, ahead, go ahead, Sherry. No, you go. I shouldn't have interrupted. I'm being Melkor. <laughs> <laughs> no, I never, 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 never. Uh, um, I was just part of when I was here's here's what here's what when when uh, um, Eugene was talking about um, about uh, um, about the story told from from Tolkien. Um, I was thinking about how that relates to um, the idea of the new song that you see in Revelation. Mm -hmm. And what occurred to me as he was speaking is that how. In order to just like the way in which listening is required in order to discover the new song because i think like in listening to each other so that we can find the harmony mm -hmm. um and so that's that and um yeah that's it that's all i had to say i was just gonna i was just gonna ask uh harvest what she's thinking about with all this talk swirling around. <laughs> it's uh, the listening is my, uh, over my four decades, uh, listening is, is something that is getting extinct in mm -hmm. my book, because when I come in, for, <laughs> sorry, I come down with, I just getting over a cough cold. But what I meant see is, I, as a storyteller, as a little child, and now I listen to people more than I, than I tell, because listening to people and hearing their story, and then in turn putting it in your story, builds a momentum that 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 touches everybody in your audience mm -hmm. audience's ears. Because you know, you look at TV, everything is quick, buy it, Joe, Joe, quick. Awesome! You gotta go and see Joe. You, you know you have to see it three or four times, and you have to do it in a quickie thing. You know you have ten people yeah. trying to sell Joe. You know, and and storytelling, it's not necessarily uh, the quick flash, flat, flat. It's more or less yeah. letting the audience for the first time let them like imagination. I love mm -hmm. this this conversations, you guys, because <laughs> um, it also involves in uh, in touching the all the different people. It's like touching a different fingertip or yeah. different fingerprint. They're all different, and um, 
And if you can just, just like now, when we're done, think back of what things that struck you, that this and that you heard, that you re remembered, you know, like the gentleman singing the song, the grandmother singing the song, doing dishes, right. you know. Hey, that struck my heart. I used to yeah. do that. <laughs> so, beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, you know, like, I have a pretty rich dream life. And, and I'm pretty good at helping people unravel their dreams. I might not be able to tell them everything, but I can, I can help them unravel them. Because the thing about dream, dreams like this is what I was talking about earlier. We, we, we are, our primordial language is images, right? We take from the world outside and we use that to describe our feelings. And, at, and when we dream, we dream of those images because those images contain all of the meaning, not some of it, all of it. Okay. And, and, um, and so it's always interesting um, listening to people talk about how they feel about something or what stood out to them. Also in stories, how they get distilled down to these certain elements, right? Uh, because to me, they're like step, they're like stepping stones, right? They take you somewhere. They take you to, in the dream, you always start somewhere and you, go somewhere else something happens and and so when you're when people describe their dream they'll emphasize the strangest things like it smelled really musty right and i'm like oh that's important you know or they'll say something like yeah and then oh that's not important but, and then they'll name something else that's really important. And you think, really? That's important, <laughs> you know? And, and those are like little stepping stones of consciousness, right? That help you understand what that person is working out in their dream or what the dream is trying to tell them. Um, John O'Donohue said recently in a talk, he said, um, I think it was a, something from the Talmud that dreams are like letters to yourself. And he said, um, he said, so I think maybe it's probably a good idea to every once, once in a while, open them. <laughs> right. And read them. <laughs> and, and, and stories are like dreams because stories also use images. And I'm getting, I'm kind of circling back to what I talked about before, but this is why Martin Shaw says we need to realize we're in a dream, right? Because we're living in this, we live in, and I'll just say it, God's imagination, right? We live in a dream. It's a dream that God had, that the creator had for us. And he put us in it. And all the things around us, all the images, all the representations are telling us a story. Yeah. Stories, stories also are like uh, dropping a rock in the water. I didn't realize that like I've been storytelling for 38 years. And it's amazing that as I'm making these little corn dust calls, dolls with these fourth graders, there was a little girl that was arguing, when I grow up, I'm going to be just like Harvest Moon. And, they, and the girls go, but you're not Native American. I know I'm not Native American, but when I grow up, I'm going to be just like her. Well, then years down the line, 20 years later, I'm at a library telling stories uh, to a, a, a overcrowded library. And the grandparents came up and said, our granddaughter was in your artisan residency. She's in college now. And she spoke about you so much yeah. that we had to come down and thank you for 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 getting her, you know, where Sorry. she is yeah. now. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, people think storytelling. Yeah, I just show up on it and just start telling funny stories. But you know, the stories are more 
more more intimidating than pastors and and yep. commercials and and Steven Spielberg if you're a good one in my book. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I couldn't shake the the Sherry told 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 this vision of, of a dream and, and imagination, and I thought of Shakespeare, right? That the theater of 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 life and and being here and playing our roles. And it seems like if we live in the world of stories, you can either embrace it and kind of add, either enact them or retell them or do something. Or ignore and to me ignoring the world of stories seems like a wrong choice so it's, it's it's almost like suicide in a way where you were just shutting yourself out and saying and maybe it's even impossible because even if you don't embrace certain stories you are guided and driven by others that are maybe not as rooted as these the ones that we told right the ancient stories that are seem to more true than the current stories that are made up by you know whoever makes them up right now so it's just about picking the right stories to believe and to live to live through rather than um one of the things i'll, I'll just say in in defense of mod modernity mm -hmm. <laughs> which i don't do very often <laughs> is that because of audible youtube audiobooks etc we now are cultivating an oral tradition again which i yeah. think is fantastic right because i remember when i first started listening to audiobooks i thought that i should be reading them but i was too lazy to read and i had other things to do so i was only listening <laughs> and then i went wait a minute we haven't been writing things down very long. Stories stories are meant to be told, right? Poetry is meant to be heard, not read. And and so I thought, no, this is this is actually really good. And you know, like all this kind of long form discussion like what we're having right now. Um, it's going to involve storytelling. We are going to tell stories about each other, to each other, right? And and so I, I think that's why people like it so much because it's calling us back to something that has been really missing in our in our culture and our societies. So. Can, can I ask a question? Yeah. I'm 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 kind of it, it's funny as much as I read um, but I'm actually kind of a slow reader. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the reasons that I'm a slow reader is that I cannot read without imagining a voice in my head. So it's like, it doesn't matter whether I'm, even if I'm not reading, if I, even if I'm not listening to an audio book, I'm hearing a voice in the book that I'm reading through my imagination. Yeah. There's a voice, there's a yeah. voice. And it's interesting, like sometimes, like say it's fiction, right? And you read it, you read fiction and later you see it adapted to the screen and it's like, there's either a resonance or a complete disconnect between what you imagined and your head as you are reading and what ends up on the screen. Yeah. Well, you know, the book I've is better. The book is better. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I've been I've been reading some things on on Grail Country. Just reading them. Like I recently read Uncle Cornelius and his story. And even for myself, okay, as the reader, I'm, I'm reading out loud, which is great, because then you get to actually hear your voice. This is Lectio Divina. That's what that practice is about. It's about, it's about accentuating your attention, right? Like really just, you've got, you've got your eyes are involved, your ears are involved, you know, all that stuff's going on. So, but even when I listen back myself to the story, I hear different things in it than when I was reading it out loud to someone. And I've had people say, oh, I read that story. I never got it. But that was really great. You know, when they hear it. And so I'm like, oh, you know, I'm not I'm not like Harvest Moon. I, I can't. I mean, I tell stories all the time, but they're just personal stories. But but um, but that's why I'm reading stories on this channel, because mm -hmm. I want because I know that people will 
you know, they might read the story, but I think it's better if they hear the story. And so that's why I'm, I'm doing it. Yeah, for sure. I, I want to, again, a little bit chaos back to circle because I wasn't able to uh, point it out initially. Um, but you spoke about technology and YouTube and audiobooks and everything. Even this technology that allows us to speak, right? I literally have the source code for this, for this whole thing. And this, like, it is also a story, right? It's, it's written in a written form. It has a different way that it's constructed. But even when people talk about how to enable this, the microphones that we use, everything, it's incredible amount of complexity. And it's truly a technological mirror, a miracle that allows us to do this right now. Mm -hmm. And it enables a form of uh, art form, right? Of, of dialogue, right? That this platonic the type of way to get to truths. And it's way more embodied in my opinion because you can talk to a book you can kind of if it's a movie you're more of a consumer and we have more and more consumer type of content but the resurgence of podcasts and of these long-form discussions uh, to me it's an indication of of people wanting to engage more and to have this um, balance of, of of sorts of question and answer or a topic that can be infused with different, you know, personality or different stories, or different, uh, what we're doing now, like we have a topic, but we brought individual pieces together, try to glue them and now see what sticks, which are, you know, something stick out and they are not common in, in them, but there are some things that are technology is the same way it's it's usually an intersection of things that usually don't fit together but then someone a group or, or a genius usually put them together in a way that it stuck um and then it propagated through throughout culture and and, and us so in in i think it's it's a very very good defense of of modernity as you said yeah so yeah, who, who wants books? to <laughs> go oh, sorry go, go ahead Sherry. go ahead well reading books is a very it's a very um 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 the best word is a german word up copslet in swiss it's like capsuled off it's a very capsuled experience right mm -hmm. like you just sit alone and you you have the space between you and the and the, and the words right and of course, your imagination is going crazy, like especially if you're reading Lord of the Rings or whatever, or, you know, myth or whatever that, you know, things like that. But but there's there's no sharing. The story is not shared. Right. It's not. And, you know, this is this is what I was talking about when I or. I think I think that there's a there's an unseen invisible world like George McDonald talks about where we actually can enter into one another's consciousnesses and we do that through looking at each other right um, and so if you have a group of people sitting together and and hearing a story they're also they're they're for like flashes instants milliseconds or whatever they're entering into that other person and going ooh you know and and, and people are doing that with you, right? It's called mirror neurons, if you want to get technical. <laughs> but, um, but it's a thing. Mm -hmm. It's really a thing, right? And, and it's, it's, it's what empathy is, is based on. And I've, I've quoted this many, many times, but like the, the mathematician Rene Tom says that there are some things that, you know, there are some places you can get to through rationality, but they're very limited, right? And everything else has to be empathically resonated with. And that's, uh, I think, Sherry, there's a connection between what you're just saying and why you keep wanting to point us back to the the idea of the dream or dreaming. Mm -hmm. Because to me, like, like that's like, the dreams come out of like, they come out of source. 
it's part of this it's yeah. part of what we share like that's why like these same images repeat right over and over again the, 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 uh, yep and and that, you know, that's why people dream the same dream images that's why you see like cross culturally you'll see like a lot of different similar images in the stories um yeah like uh and so that it it, it, it points to the we earlier we were talking about like the you our, our uniqueness right and then but we also but we also have a there's there's a way in which we're all one too and yet we have to hold that's what kind of be this is this is the mystery of being human is holding these two things in tension the fact that we are all one and completely unique Ooh. both things are true yeah yeah i want to blow eugene's mind right now are you ready for this? <laughs> <I'm> ready. <Go ahead. laughs> cover in, the walls in, <laughs> in george mcdonald's imagination essay he says for what are the forms by means of which a man may reveal his thoughts? Are they not those of nature? Yeah. But although he is created in the closest sympathy with these forms, yet even these forms are not born in his mind. What springs there is the perception that this or that form is already an expression of this or that phase of thought or of feeling. For the world around him is an outward figuration of the condition of his mind an inexhaustible storehouse of forms whence he may choose exponents the crystal pictures that shall protect his thought and not need to be broken that the light might break forth the meanings are in those forms already else they could be no garment of unveiling God has made the world that it should thus serve his creature, developing in the service that imagination whose necessity it meets. The man has but to light the lamp within the form. His imagination is the light. It is not the form. Wow. Straightway the shining thought makes the form visible and becomes itself visible through the form. So when I went through this essay, I just I just kept going, okay, I gotta I gotta grasp this. My imagination is the light that lights the lamp in the forms, which are creation. Okay? The, those of nature is what George says. All the things around us have a lamp in them, and my imagination has to light that lamp. Okay? That's amazing. That's amazing. And then, Eugene, here's the mind-blowing part. And then I was like, oh, my God. C.S. Lewis put a lamp in Narnia. That's the first <laughs> that's the opening <laughs> scene. Okay? He probably didn't even think about it. Oh, he did. He, he did. did. Because Okay. Oh, yeah, because he says in his anthology, he said, I'm just going to have to make this explicit, folks, but George MacDonald is my master, and there is nothing yeah. that I have not learned. You know, I've never written a thing yeah. that doesn't include him in it, either a quote or an idea or whatever. Wow. And so I'm like, and, and they come through a wardrobe, okay? Uh -huh. They clothe their thoughts, right? Uh -huh with that of nature and they go they get into narnia and they light the lamp within the form amazing there it is thank you for sharing it wow <laughs> I all right speaking of candles and, and lights um i wasn't sure i i have to excuse and, and and apologize but i wasn't sure how long these are we're gonna go um make candles for the liturgy so well you can uh, do that you thank you that. thank you so much yes. it was a thank pleasure you thank vlog. you vlog thank you vlog. nice to meet you yeah. i would i would like to have at least at least one more story before we wrap up Does i'll anyone... have to watch it i'll have to yeah watch yeah it. you yeah. can watch it i understand vlog. yeah <laughs> go yeah ahead. go to liturgy <laughs> that's important <laughs> it's a... <laughs> well do you know a story about kashe the deathless in the slavic folklore 
No, but I'd love to hear it. As well, I'm not gonna tell the whole story unless uh, you guys have something else to share. I mean, yeah. it's it's pretty it's pretty amazing because um, I've been. Uh, well, it's a story that all the children in Russia know. Uh, well, it's like um, Kashe the Deathless. He's basically like a Voldemort uh, in the in the giant rolling world. He's a guy who once was a human being, but he uh, wanted to become deathless, immortal. And uh, the way he did it is he took out parts of himself, the most vulnerable parts of himself, and he put put those vulnerable parts into objects, magical objects, and, uh, in a needle, and the needle is in the a, in a egg, and the egg is in the duck, and the duck is in the hair, and the hair is in a, in a chest, and the chest is on a, a chain, and the chain is up on a tree, on an oak tree, which is far, far away on the, on the end, at the end of the world. So... The good guy, usually Ivan the Tsarevich, the, the, tsar, the son of the Tsar, who is going out to the fortress where this evil protagonist, Kashe, lives to rescue the maiden you know, that, that, that he stole, kidnapped <clears throat> for himself to marry. So he has to go and find that where his death is. And, uh, of course, there's all sorts of creatures that help him on the way. Uh, but the thing is, what really blows my mind is that um, the evil person, like Voldemort or, uh, uh, or Melkor or um, uh, Sauron, they kind of have the same pattern going on in their mind. It's like, I need to become immortal. I need to become deathless. You know, but there's so much vulnerability in, in me as a human being. So I have to externalize it somehow and put it away, hide it from everybody, including myself. And I will have to put it in some object and put it away to the, at the end of the world so that nobody else will be able to see me as vulnerable at all, including myself. But this, this good guy goes to the end of the world and uncovers that thing and that's when the, the evil uh per, the evil guy got, dies uh but what's also amazing is that um it's basically harry potter story you know with horcruxes well what's also amazing is that this evil guy is not content with just being deathless and mortal and cachet always wants uh to cat kidnap uh, a young maiden and he wants to marry her, and she refuses. And he's offering her everything, like gold and everything you can imagine. And she, she basically says, I cannot. This is just crazy. Uh, but he, uh, I mean, uh, growing up, I was always like, uh, it was a big, big question in my mind. Why? Why would you want that? I mean, if you have it all and you are deathless, what, what else? And you realize that, you know, the person who, decided to basically to pursue immortality through the back door really misses out on life and they want to live vicariously through somebody else um, and they need somebody else to live through mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. they can't get it it's like the story of in the Silmarillion of Melkor who basically created this cacophony and he's walking around in void places of the world looking for the flame imperishable, but he cannot find it because it is with Iluvatar. And um, so there was, uh, it's, I mean, to this day, it's so mind blowing because uh, even looking at the modern day politics all over the world uh, and looking in, inside my own heart, I mean, I can tell that I can see pretty much, you know, the same pattern unfolding almost every day uh, yeah. either I want to become in, invincible and invulnerable and put that vulnerability somewhere far far away so nobody can see it and then I become deathless but I lose out 
on right it. yeah uh, and and then and the good guy has to go all the way yes all the way to the right. end of the world the, and, and <laughs> whatever it the, takes he's the good guy yeah yeah right and and you know like i I've, I've said this multiple times you know you have to be willing to walk out into the landscape of pain and suffering you know because essentially that's where the good guy goes right he goes to these dark dark places and and this is the theme that is you know very common in fairy tales and myth is that you go down or you go into the dark wood or you know whatever right and 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 it and it's through this this process that you that you discover you know the name right that you that you recognize at some point the who i am right which is really what we're always lo looking for i think <laughs> You know, as as uh, as Eugene was sharing that story, I couldn't help that, that what kept going through my mind, what I couldn't help but think about is to contrast what he was talking about and, and, and what the what the you know, what the bad guy's doing with the with my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Right. Like and how that's like it's the absolutely the inversion of that. Inversion. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. The Harvest, do you have one more story? Thank you for asking. I was going to ask if you didn't. <laughs> Please, <laughs> if you would grace us with one more story, I would one appreciate it. One more story? Oh, <laughs> uh, boy, you guys are... <laughs> All right. I always take my glasses off and just so that I really believe that the eyes and facial is all is a main part of the stories. The old altar ways are dying. Turn back the tide. Stop the wind. Listen. Mother Earth begs of you. Her waters filled with oil and waste. The air stagnated with the stench of death. Otter, swift, sleek demeanor brings her distinguished spirit alive otter spirit is yours a reflection of your mind and heart open your ears listening will restore beauty to mother earth oh otter became legendary when she was just a young pup with my ears listen she always spoke from her heart and could see a person's soul. With perseverance, she formed and delegated to each and every animal the importance of cooperation, thus establishing a well-rounded, safe life for all the animals. A truly true tranquility base that is until the brutal summer sun scorching mother earth drying ponds creeks and even lakes the critters and the two legs plagued with dust and thirst as the thin high clouds arrive with a quick flash of lightning torching the dry brittle forest the white flames of death devouring every living thing as the dense smoke of death fill the air this happened every summer just bringing more pain and turmoil for all left living each and every animal had every idea that could be imagined to bring an end to the hot days. Oh, owl used up all his wisdom. Eagle, sharp, keen eyes could only focus on the past. Rabbit preferred to hide in his hole wall, while beaver just whittled away. Woodpecker. He got so mad, he started banging his head against a tree. Now, 
Otto was at her wits and too, being so young and just adorable. What set her apart was the wisdom the elders taught her, creating and molding a well-balanced mind. She ate well, swam daily, and helped others. The last and only resort the animals had left was to confront the great and powerful raven. Oh, many had seen him create the sun, moon, stars, and much more. If only Otter could convince him for a miracle or, or, or a small wish of sorts. This, in turn, would set in motion the animal's demise plan. But sadly, Raven only cared about his own needs and wants. Me, 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 just turned his back and even laughed. Otter, exhausted and drained from Raven's rude behavior, she retreated to a warm and calm inlet to be left alone and collect her thoughts. A swift high tide and a fun and fast current whisked her right into a sleeping whale. Her tiny furry body tickled the young whale awake. Otter quick dove in distance. You see, the ocean clan, animals, birds, fish, didn't really mingle that much. Oh, the magnitude of the size of the ocean, she rarely met twice. The first for Otter to see a whale alone in the small inlet. She politely introduced herself, then asked, Who are you? And where do you go? The young whale stretched and yawned. I am Kika, and I'm traveling far up north to visit the great white spirit. Otter, curiosity, she swam closer to her new big friend. Whale had heard of this young otter, and just her eyes told him that she would be in <clears throat> legends and go down in history. Oh, no doubt she managed to lead and teach each of the living creatures the importance of your unique and essential jobs, jobs that would piece together a plan that would rid the hot days forever. Whale knew he too would join ranks of greatness because of his close connection to the great white spirit that just so happens to grant wishes. The final piece Otter needed. So to no surprise, Whale promised Otter he would ask the great white spirit for a reprieve of the long, hot summer day. Many moons came and gone. Whale returned safe with wish in place. Days started getting hotter. They started to dry when all of a sudden the two-legged words begin to echo throughout the woods. Fire! The people only had enough time to gather what they could in one arm load and place it in the canoe where they paddled all oh, so far from shore. Many had seen it too many times and bowed their heads as, as whale and otter closed their eyes as tears 
began to fall. Then there was one drop of rain and another drop of rain and another drop of rain. The skies opened up and continued to rain until every single fire was put out. The small creeks turned into streams, streams turned into rivers, meadows turned into lakes that never dried out as moss and ferns grew before your eyes as spruce, douglas, maples, alders, and cedars all reach for the sky. So, whenever my people hear people complaining about the rain, we just smile because we know the land that you see today was not the way it was until Otter brought the water to the rainforest. Oh, and by the way, as you gaze on all our beautiful totem poles here in the Pacific Northwest, take a second glance and I guarantee you will see a whale. Nahashka, thank you. <laughs> Thank Beautiful. You so Thank you so much, Harvest. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> There's a lot into that one. I actually created that one because I you mentioned, boy, there's so many topics that I've been I've been coming across in my own life. And that is I get calls on people that we want a legend that has to do with a bear. We want it to be about 10 minutes long. And it's like they're they're poking a a uh, 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 storytelling 101 and, and yeah. uh, it's more than just stories <laughs> yeah yeah you made that that's your story that one you just told yeah yeah oh, great <laughs> so good I know. And, and, and the owl you know they used yeah. up all their wisdom all the people were trying to figure out all the animals were trying to use their best knowledge to to overcome them and that's and people don't complain about being in the rainforest when they come to visit here right <laughs> and you know it's interesting because like i know where i where where i live Sher right sherry's now. on the other side of the cascades <laughs> i'm in a dry oh, park okay. wherever, I, wherever i'm yells fire <laughs> but but um like a hundred years ago, I, I have a, a really old homestead on my property and, and, um, and it was, it belonged to the, the sister in law. I mean, there was a couple here, the woodses, I'll just use their names. It's easier. <laughs> the woodses and, and, um, Mrs. Woods was the sister to a guy named Eric Collier. And they were, they were both first nations women. And Eric Collier was an Englishman who wrote a book called Three Against the Wilderness. And it's about him and his wife and their son, Visi. And Eric wanted to come to Canada and be a trapper and live in the woods. He had a dream, okay? And when he got here, everything had been trapped out. All, there were no beaver, there were no muskrat, there was nothing, no otters, nothing. And so he lives, he, he basically, Eric Collier lived just like, as the crow flies, you know, like, I don't know, 20 kilometers behind my place. And, and, um, and so, and it's up, it's up higher on a plateau and they could see all these deep wells in the land where there had been lakes and swamps and they could see old Creek beds, but they were all gone. They were all dried up and, and, um, and they were dried up because there were no beaver and there were no otter and there were no muskrat. And so they started building their own dams. These two, like Eric and his wife, the story is incredible, actually. And and um, and then when the rains came, or the you know the the runoff from winter, these these places started to they didn't fill up because they had to soak all the water first. So it took them years. Okay, these two, these two people. 
and and then and then the muskrats started showing up and then a man from england brought them a pair of beavers a male and a female oh cool and they, and they dropped them out into the wilderness and then the otters came back and so like these when you're talking about the otter i i know what you're talking about because because when these animals show up, it, it, it means that the, the ecosystem that they belong to is healthy and flourishing. And when it is healthy and flourishing, the human beings are healthy and flourishing, right? Mm -hmm. And, and this, is, this, is, this gets back to being able to listen to the animals. Like, there we go. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. Thank you, Harvest. Oh, you're welcome. I think it was a treat, the way you told it. <laughs> That's yeah. Well, thank you everyone for joining me today. I I hope if we do another another story stream that you'd come back, um, both of you, um, okay. to yeah. join us. And um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your stories. Um, it was delightful. Thank you for your singing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for your singing, Nate. You're <laughs> thank you. Good, I have to say. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was just delightful. And um, Harvest, we'll have to we'll have to connect because we're close. I'm in yeah. Olympia, so we'll have to have coffee sometime. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Okay, I'll reach out. I'll, I'll leave you guys with shortest legend ever. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> and you you have my permission to share it to everyone, your family, friends, and such. And it goes like this: a salmon went up the river and came to a dam. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. We'll end on that note. Thank you very much. It was delightful. Yeah, thank you. It was really a pleasure to be here with you all. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I've known you forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. You guys have a great day. And yeah. uh, Take and care. you step in, step in a couple of mud puddles today, all right? <laughs> we'll do, we'll do. Sounds good. <laughs> all right. Thank yeah, you for bye. inviting me. Bye. Yeah.